This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening, my name is Cheryl Peach. I'm a program scientist here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening in the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series. Jennifer Taylor is an assistant scientist here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She works in the Marine Biology Research Division and she earned her bachelor's here in California at UC Santa Barbara in biology. She earned her PhD in biology on the East Coast at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and then proceeded to a postdoctoral position at, again, back here in California at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she's a relative newbie here. She joined uh, Scripps in 2013 um, after a brief stint in the middle of the country at Indiana and Purdue universities. So Jennifer actually studies something that I think is, um, is familiar to all of us, but perhaps not in the way uh, that we typically think of these animals. You can see the crustaceans she's presented here. She actually studies the biomechanics of their exoskeleton, the outer skeleton that they use uh, to support themselves and protect themselves. And her overarching research is really focused on understanding how those exoskeletons relate to their behavior, their ecology, and their evolution, and then understanding how human impacts might have influenced um, their form and function. So uh, Jennifer is, uh, as I said, new here. Uh, in conversation with her uh, when she arrived, I've just found that she is about to receive um, her equipment, the tools that she uses to study um, the exoskeletons and the biomechanics of these organisms in the next couple of weeks. So she's really excited to get going um, back on the research that you're going to hear about. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming her for her talk titled Armed and Armored, The Amazing Evolutionary Story of Crustaceans. Jennifer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening at Birch and be able to talk to you about crustaceans, a group of animals that I find especially interesting. And I hope that by the end of the talk this evening, you will f have a greater appreciation for them as well, if you don't already. So my goal tonight is to highlight some interesting aspects about this group of animals and what makes them good research subjects and then also to tell a couple of research stories that pertain to the kind of research that I do, and then have also revealed some key insights into these iconic green animals. So I'll begin by telling you that these animals are impressively, impressively diverse, okay? There are several major groups of crustaceans that range from tiny ostracods and copepods that might just be a millimeter in size, all the way up to the giant spider crabs that can have a leg span of 12 feet. Okay. So impressively diverse. While most crustaceans are pretty mobile, so they swim, they crawl, there are also crustaceans that are sessile. So even those barnacles that you find out in the tide pools are in the same group, okay? So impressively diverse group of animals. For the most part, I'm going to focus on these groups over here. So your crabs, your shrimp, and your lobsters. In addition to being um, tax uh, morphologically diverse, these crustaceans have evolved to inhabit pretty diverse um, kinds of habitats. So you have them fairly deep in the deep sea around hydrothermal vents. They live in marshlands among grass and intertidal zones. 
They have also evolved to life on land multiple times. So you have ghost crabs that crawl across the sand. You have small um, uh, grapsid crabs that occupy mangrove trees and rarely even go to the water, so they just crawl around and live in the trees. And then you have the largest terrestrial arthropod, the coconut crab or robber crab, which you see here, you know, not living amongst the garbage cans, but um, fairly large. So there are other reasons to study crustaceans. <laughs> So they are a very important commercial species. So cumulatively, they represent one of the largest commercial fisheries in the world. They also have a lot of biomimetic potential. Okay? In particular, the exoskeleton, which I'm going to spend some time talking to you about, is a pretty remarkable structure. It's fairly strong and pretty lightweight. And its structure has inspired some researchers to think about how they could apply that structure to more human interests. So because they're lightweight and strong, it might provide better armor, for instance, for soldiers. So they can carry around a lighter structure that still provides the same amount of protection. Because it's lightweight and strong, it might also be a good uh, a good material to model for, um, for transportation, so cars and airplanes, in the sense that if it's lightweight and still is strong, it might improve fuel efficiency and therefore provide benefit to our environment. So the exoskeleton, we often refer to what it's made out of as the cuticle, and I'm going to spend just a minute or two highlighting what this important structure looks like. So here we have a diagram of a section from a generic crustacean exoskeleton, and you'll see that it has a lot of different components to it. There are actually four different layers, all secreted by this, these epidermal cells along the bottom. You have this outer epicuticle that is kind of waxy and very thin. Beneath that, you have this exocuticle and an endocuticle. These two layers they're composed of a lot of proteins and chitin, and they become calcified. So calcium gets deposited in these layers, giving the, the exoskeleton its hardness, its stiffness. And then below that, you have a membranous layer that is not calcified. If we look in more detail at the structure, so this is a scanning electron micrograph showing a, a section through the cuticle. And we see each of these different layers, the epicuticle, the exocuticle, and the endocuticle. We don't see these two, the membranous layer. But if you look very detailed at the structure, um, beneath the epicuticle, these two layers here have a pretty um, unique layout or structure. So all these different fibers and stuff that make this cuticle are arranged um, in a very organized manner, so that each successive layer is oriented at an angle to the one above it, essentially forming this helicoid-type pattern. So having this helicoid-type pattern is one aspect that helps make this structure fairly strong, but also lightweight. So crustaceans, again, this is just a general a structure of a cuticle, but crustaceans can modify this in a lot of different ways. So they can alter the kinds of proteins that are in it. They can alter the amount of calcium or the different types of mineral. They can alter which layers they have. Maybe they reduce the endocuticle to um, a very thin layer. So there are different ways that they can play around with it. But in essence, the structure is uh, pretty uniform among crustaceans. Because crustaceans have this exoskeleton on the outside, the exoskeleton has been adapted to perform many different functions. Okay? And on here, we see pictures of some of these functions. So at the most basic level, like a bridge, the exoskeleton provides an animal with its shape and basic support. 
in conjunction with muscles that are attached to it. It allows for locomotion and movement. Like this row of guards, the exoskeleton is the main barrier to the environment. So it helps determine what gets into and out of the animal. It processes food. So both the claws and the mouth parts all serve to grind up food as it passes into the animal. What many people don't know is that crustaceans aren't very quiet. They actually communicate quite a bit through sound. And they do it in a variety of ways, either tapping their claws against the substrate or rubbing articulated surfaces together. And so they communicate to each other and to potential predators using these forms of communication. If they communicate to each other, they also need to be able to hear them, right? And in some species of crabs, such as the ghost crabs, it's been shown that the legs have been modified as an arthropod version of an ear. So it serves to amplify vibrations as they pass from the substrate or even through the air, um, enabling the crabs to hear the animals that are communicating with them. It also can be modified to, to use as a deadly or potent weapon, as we will talk about in the lecture today. The exoskeleton is responsible for providing camouflage to animals, whether it's simply coloration to blend in with their background or some kind of morphological adaptation to blend in with their environment. And then finally, it serves as protective armor, whether this is from animals in the intertidal zone where debris may be striking it, or if it's in battles with conspecifics or potential predators. Okay, the skeleton serves as a nice coat of armor. For today, I'm just going to focus on a couple of these. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. One has to do with how the skeleton provides these basic functions of support and locomotion. And the other is how specific adaptations in mantis shrimp um, uh, allow the exoskeleton to serve as a potent weapon and also a shield. OK, so let me begin by telling you about blue crabs. Um, as you can see from this picture, this marine crab looks pretty fierce. If you look at it, it is covered with spines pretty much all over it. And if you've ever tried to handle a live blue crab, you'll know that they're just as fierce as they look. Okay? So they're covered in spines. The skeleton is very stiff. If you've ever tried, you know, you eat crabs at a restaurant and you need a special you know, claw to crunch it open, right? It's a pretty strong, uh, tough armor that animals have. What a lot of people, um, or I should say one thing that a lot of people don't appreciate about crabs is that this armor um, constantly needs to be shed and secreted anew in order for the animal to grow. So anytime you have a skeleton on the outside, you can only get bigger by shedding it off and growing a new one. So crabs undergo, like all crustaceans, a molting process. Okay? And I'm going to show you a series of pictures depicting this molting process. So what happens is here we have a blue crab. And as it gets ready to molt, it will begin degrading some of that old cuticle, some of the components from the old skeleton. It will then start secreting two of the um, four layers of a new skeleton beneath the old one. After those new layers have been secreted, the animal will start taking in water and ballooning up to a, a bigger size so that the pressure is enough that it cracks the old skeleton at preformed suture areas, which you see here. So usually along the back, the splits open. The crab will continue building up, back out of its old shell, continue drawing in water until it gets to a bigger size, sometimes as much as 30 or 40% bigger than its original size. And then it will, before it hardens, of course, it's often fried and put on a sandwich. 
So if you do like, if you do eat soft shell crabs, this is essentially what you are eating is a newly molted blue crab. Okay. Once the animal has backed out of its old shell, it will secrete the last layers of the cuticle and then over a period of several days, it will begin hardening the cuticle by adding calcium and other minerals. And here I have a video of a blue crab molting. So here it is backing out of its old shell. And I want to point out that as the crab is backing out, this new skeleton or the cuticle is entirely soft. Okay? It is essentially has the texture of saran wrap. It is incredibly flimsy. And if you watch as the crab moves its claw, brush, it just folds like nothing. There's no stiffness to this animal whatsoever. Okay. So the two things that are striking here, one, this animal has essentially lost its protective armor. So every time an animal molts, it becomes especially vulnerable to any potential predators or even conspecifics. The animals are very cannibalistic, so they need to find a good hiding spot. And two, the animal has essentially lost its skeletal system. Okay? You can imagine this is a huge problem. Our skeletons are necessary for giving us our shape and for allowing us to move in locomo. Right? But here, as you can see in this video, this crab still maintains its shape, so it still looks like a crab, and it is still able to perform fairly forceful movements as it backs itself out of the old skeleton. And to be able to describe what's happening here, let me point out some basics about skeletal support systems. So in animals with rigid skeletons, like vertebrates, mammals here, where we have stiff elements on the inside, and we have pairs of antagonistic muscles that attach them. When a muscle contracts, it shortens, and it pulls on these stiff elements, affecting movement, right? When your biceps muscle contracts, it lifts your arm up. To return it to the original position, you need your triceps muscle in the back to contract and return your arm to the resting position. Arthropods work the same way, only their rigid skeleton is on the outside, but they still have muscles inside that contract and pull against these stiff elements, allowing the animal to move. Now, when crustaceans undergo this molting process, they lose every stiff element in their body. Um, I have in here something for you to look at. So this is the shed exuvium of a blue crab. And I'll pass it around so you can check it out. But you can remove the carapace. And if you notice, it molts a lot of internal components as well. So the lining of the gills, the lining of the gut, everything gets molted when an animal sheds its skeleton. So it's a really fascinating and dramatic process. OK, so all of these stiff elements have been shed, the animal is left with no stiff component in its body. Okay? It's completely soft. And at this point, what my research in the past has shown is that the animals are switching over to a completely different type of skeletal support system, one that is common in soft-bodied animals, like worms or like sea anemones that you see out here in the tide pools or at the aquarium. And so let me describe to you how this works. So in a typical a sea anemone is sort of your classical hydrostatic animal. So that's an animal that uses water as its skeletal support system. They are typically you know, cylindrical in shape, like this anemone. They have a body wall that has antagonistic muscles. In this case, we're talking about sheets of muscles, so circular muscles, and also sheets of longitudinal muscles. And this body wall surrounds a volume of fluid inside. Okay. It is this volume of fluid that provides the stiffness to which muscles can contract against, much like the stiff elements in the exoskeleton or in our bones. To understand how that works, let's simplify this animal into just a cylinder. OK? 
Okay? So this is an enemy, just simplified as a cylinder, and it is, has a constant volume of water filling it. Water is essentially incompressible. You can squeeze it, but you cannot compress it. Right? So if you were to apply a force to compress this cylinder, what would happen is that you'd get a change in shape because the volume remains constant. Okay? You cannot reduce the volume. The water is incompressible. Okay? In essence, it's like a water balloon. Okay? So next time you're playing with a water balloon, go ahead and try and compress it. <laughs> okay? What's going to happen is it's going to bulge out one side. Okay? It's going to change shape. Okay? You cannot reduce its volume. Now, while a big shape change might work for animals like an earthworm or a sea anemone, not all animals would benefit from this big sh change in shape. And there's a way around it. So let's suppose we wrap that same cylinder with what we refer to as a tensile resistant membrane. So this is a covering, or the exoskeleton, if you will, that resists being stretched. In other words, it will resist increasing in diameter. Okay. In this case, if we apply that same force to compress it, what happens is we don't get a change in shape, but we get an increase in pressure, okay? an increase in pressure of the fluid inside that animal. And the greater force you apply, the higher the pressure. And this is something that you can easily measure. And I won't go into details about that, but you can measure force uh, of muscle contraction and you can measure pressure. And for instance, in a crab, every time it contracts a muscle in the claw, that shortening is going to be pulling against the, the cuticle and that volume of fluid, because it's incompressible, is going to be resisting that. Okay, so that volume of fluid is essentially acting like that stiff element. So, we have animals that go from pretty tough armor during their normal intermolt phase, okay? This is actually named crab, so that's why I use that one. Uh, alternating between essentially a balloon, okay? So, heavily armored, to pretty vulnerable. And they do this repeatedly throughout their life cycle. Pretty frequently when they're small, they may do this every week, every few days. When they get older, maybe they'll only do it once a year, so when, as they get larger. Now I mentioned that crabs are pretty neat because they've also evolved to life on land. And because their skeleton is on the outside, they still have to go through the same molting process. Of course, there's different challenges for animals on land. For the blue crabs in the water, they have the water, the buoyancy of water to help support them during the stage, and they also have a supply of water to drink and inflate during molting. Crabs that live on land, however, vary in their access to water and in the degree of how terrestrial they are. This crab here, for instance, this black back land crab, it lives um, in tropical areas, so unfortunately you have to go there to study them. <laughs> and these animals are almost entirely terrestrial, and they will only return to the water to spawn their eggs. The rest of the time, they live in burrows. So if you look down here, you'll see a burrow here. If you can make it out, here's a crab that's trying to threaten me. And this is the habitat these particular crabs live off of Puerto Rico. So they're still fairly close to the water, but they never actually go to the water except to spawn. So without water available to inflate or to provide support when they're molting, um, what do they do? Okay, so first, they do molt the same way. And as you'll see in the exuvium that's being passed around, uh, there's an, uh, an entire internal component that gets molted. So the same is true for terrestrial crabs. I'll show you a video of a newly molted land crab. So this is its shed exuvium up here, and down here is the crab. As you can see, it's not quite as mobile 
as the blue crab was newly after molting. So it's not really able to use those little legs to hold its body up above the substrate, but it, yet it can move these pretty hefty claws and drag its body around. Okay, so pretty vulnerable on land. Turns out that these animals have a pretty, a pretty neat adaptation to molting on land. So if we look here, so this picture um, just represents what we're looking at up here. They actually inflate their gut with air. Okay. This is common among insects as well when insects are molting. They swallow air and essentially blow up an internal balloon. Okay. How does that work for these animals? Let's go back to our cylinder example. So when we had a tensile resistant membrane and applied a force to compress it, we had an increase in pressure. Well, imagine now that we have an internal balloon here. If we blow up the balloon, we increase the pressure. So by blowing up the gut with air, you're increasing the overall body turgor of the animal. So you're making it essentially stiffer and allowing the animal to contract its <coughs> muscles against this incompressible volume of fluid. You can actually go about deflating these animals. So you can stick a needle in the gut and withdraw air. In fact, if you poke it, you can hear a hissing sound mm -hmm. as the air escapes out of the gut. But if you withdraw the air from the gut, this is what happens. So this is in your normal um, inflated crab, and this is what happens to a deflated crab. So just simply removing the air from the gut, you've decreased the body turgor or the pressure so much that the skeleton becomes all wrinkly. Okay. In, in this stage, the animal is not even able to move. So it depends on that body turgor. Um, in order to be able to move. Okay, so that's the story of crabs and how essentially they function like water balloons every time they, they molt or air balloons. The next story I'll tell you is about mantis shrimp weaponry and armor. So mantis shrimp, if any of you are not familiar with them, they are known, so one's depicted up here, they are known for having a specialized appendage called a raptorial appendage that can shoot out and essentially punch their prey or other mantis shrimp with incredibly high forces and at incredibly high velocities. And I'll get to that in a second. But there are a couple of different categories of mantis shrimp. Some have appendages like you see here that are modified with all these spines that we call spears and they essentially reach out and capture moving prey. But what's of more interest are ones that have an appendage that looks like this, in which we call smashers. So instead of a spear, they have this nice little hammer-like appendage. Okay. So these animals are capable of producing incredibly fast strikes. So they can go over 20 meters per second in water, and they can produce forces that are many times their own body size. Um, they've been known, or at least the larger ones have been known, to be able to crack aquarium glass. And this, the accelerations have been compared to that of uh, 22 caliber bullets. Okay? So in, very impressive weapons. They are able to achieve these kinds of strikes through the properties of the exoskeleton. So if we look here, when an animal is getting ready to strike, it will cock its hammer-like appendage back by contraction of a muscle. When it, this muscle contracts and cocks this appendage, it's like compressing a spring. Okay. So it stores up all the energy. When the animal is ready to release this appendage, it relaxes the muscle. All that energy stored in the spring causes this hammer-like appendage to fling forward at those really high velocities. And I have a couple videos to show you. Here is a mantis shrimp striking a snail. So fast you can't really see it, you just see the snail flying. And here's one in slow motion. Okay. And 
And as my mentor, Dr. Paddock, she did a lot of research on the strike of these mantis shrimp. And she found that their strikes are so fast that they produce these cavitations. So that flash of white you saw there is actually a cavitation bubble. That when it collapses produces tons of energy. Heat, almost as hot as the sun, and impressive um, forces and, and power. So like many other animals that have these really potent weapons, these animals, the mantis shrimp, tend to try and resolve disputes through ritualized fighting behavior. Okay. So for example, your deer with these pretty um, potent uh, antlers, uh, they can, instead of causing damage or risking injury, they'll often go through a series of very organized behaviors in which they assess each other before a fight escalates to the point where one can suffer injury or death. So in the deer, for example, they'll often walk side by side, kind of measuring each other up, seeing who's bigger kind of thing. If that doesn't work, it might escalate to an antler lock, where they continue pushing each other. And then usually, some, at some point, um, one of the contestants will give in and end the, and end the battle. Venomous snakes also do this as well. So they will coil up and raise their heads up high, trying to look bigger, you know, getting as high as they can. If that doesn't work, then they'll start wrestling and trying to push down the other one with its head before it escalates any further. Mantis shrimp have a pretty unusual form of ritualized behavior. So first, they will spread out their claws into a marrow, threads, marrow spread threat display again, trying to look bigger and intimidate the conspecific. Um, it will then escalate to uh, a fighting match in which they take turns punching each other on a specific area of the body. So these animals are very territorial, and they will fight over burrows. In this picture, you see uh, an opponent here and a mantis shrimp inside a burrow. And when they want to battle over a burrow, one of the contestants will present its tail, or called a telson, to the opponent. The opponent will strike it with those powerful appendages right in the telson, and then they switch places. And the other one will present its telson and get it punched. And they'll do this back and forth until one of the animals gives up. So this behavior, not only do they have this powerful weapon, but they also have this shield, this tail, or telson, that can resist repeated forceful blows, blows that crush snails into pieces, that crush other crabs into pieces, that can break glass. But yet, they have these tails that can resist um, dozens or even hundreds of punches without showing any signs of damage. To study that, you need to be able to record some of these instances. And so here I have a video showing a live animal in a makeshift burrow. So here's a live animal. And this is just a frozen animal <laughs> presented in the coiled position. To be able to capture it, you need a high-speed video camera. So I was recording these at 15,000 frames per second. And I'm playing it back much slower so you can actually see what's happening. So powerful punch to the telson. What is it about the telson that allows it to resist that punch? Studying it is not quite so easy. Anything, any kind of impact study is pretty difficult because it happens on such a short time scale, you know, fractions of a second. So it's hard to study. And also, the structure, the telson, is a pretty complex structure. It's um, very three-dimensional. And it's very difficult to use kind of your standard um, engineering type test to understand how this, this structure responds to these forceful blows. And so one of the fun things about being a scientist is that you get to think of different ways to address your questions. And one way that I approached this was by borrowing a concept of physics called coefficient of restitution, just very simply. 
it is a measure of the energy <coughs> dynamics during a collision. So how much energy gets lost and how much energy gets returned to the colliding objects. All right, so it's represented just the velocity of the objects after the collision divided by the velocity of objects before the collision. Okay. This is something that is used to, it can be used to analyze car accidents, so impacts. It's also used to regulate a variety of sporting goods equipment. Okay. So this is a measure essentially of the elasticity of the objects colliding. So you can imagine that, for instance, for a baseball bat, if it's really elastic and therefore has a high coefficient of restitution, the ball will get sent flying. A lot of that energy will go back to the ball and send the ball flying farther. Okay? So there's a lot of energy that gets um, returned to the objects after they collide. So how do you apply this to animals? You strap them onto a tabletop slab <laughs> and you bounce little steel balls off of them. So bouncing balls off of different parts of the animal. And you could calculate just essentially how elastic that collision is. And for those of you that have not bounced balls off of crustaceans, <laughs> this is what it looks like in slow motion bouncing off the tail. And this is what it looks like bouncing off the abdomen. Okay. And so simply by video recording these and looking at the velocities, you can determine how much energy was lost during this impact. And that gives you some other information. So it turns out that the telson actually loses a lot of energy. So in essence, it functions more like a punching bag. Okay, a punching bag serves to dissipate energy. When a boxer strikes the punching bag, a lot of that energy gets lost, and the boxer's appendage returns with a less velocity, right? As opposed to if it was a very elastic uh, collision, kind of like something, somebody jumping on a trampoline, a lot of that energy gets returned. As the person bounces on the trampoline, that energy gets um, stored and then returned to the jumper so that they essentially jump higher. Okay, so there's a lot of energy that remains in that collision. The fact that we know the Telson acts more like a punching bag may provide some new information to animals as they are performing this ritualized fighting. So not only for the animal that is being hit by the, the conspecific, but also for the animal that's doing the punching. You know, how much energy is being returned to that appendage as it leaves the, the strike of the, of the telson. Another interesting aspect about this structure, mantis shrimp, comes from studies of the uh, three-dimensional structure and mineralization pattern, so how much calcium and how much hardness you have. This, these are CT scans, so they're three-dimensional scans. On this top row we have of an abdominal segment, so one of the places the ball bounced off of. And then on the bottom row we have a telson. In this first column, it's just a three-dimensional structure, okay, three-dimensional model. In the middle column, you'll note these areas with, um, that are brighter. And this, these brighter areas essentially represent areas of greater density of mineral and so forth, areas that are stiffer. Okay. So there's a lot more mineral in certain areas on this telson than there is on the abdomen. Okay. Down here is just a cross section showing that the abdomen is a fairly thin, uniform structure if you cut through it, whereas the telson has areas of thicker cuticle um, surrounding areas of thinner cuticle. Now the interesting thing that comes from this is that here we have animals that have these telson shields that must resist significant impact and it turns out they design it in similar ways that we design our impact resisting structures. For instance, our bicycle helmets. Okay. So what they're doing is they're combining areas that are fairly stiff with areas that are pretty compliant, so that means they're more flexible. Having stiff components prevents penetration when you have an object colliding or striking you at these really high velocities. 
Whereas having areas that are compliant helps to disperse the force so that it gets spread out and you don't feel as much of an impact force. And so combining stiff and compliant regions of the tail is actually the same kind of strategy that we see in bicycle helmets and other impact resistant structures. And so with that, those two stories that I have told you, I just want to leave you thinking about how this exoskeleton structure of crustaceans can be adapted to perform so many varied um, and interesting functions that are crucial for animals. And these are also avenues of research that I am pursuing here at Scripps. So not only in terms of the functional diversity that the exoskeleton allows, but also in terms of how morphological diversity can be achieved through modifications in the structure. So um, everything from spines to color camouflage, bending, blending in with the environment. And then also how crustaceans have adapted to life in very different environmental conditions, from the deep sea to the trees, um, swimming, crawling, climbing. And then finally, not only how they've adapted to these different environments, but also how changes in the environment are going to impact the integrity of their exoskeleton structure and therefore have significant impacts on its ability to perform some of these different functions that I have highlighted for you today. And so with that, I thank all the people and funding and animals that helped make this research possible. And then I thank you for coming and listening. Okay, sure, question, yes. Yeah. After the shell, the open shell is being shed, how long does it take for the new one to harden up and can the animal vary that to make it go slower or faster? Okay, so the question was after the old shell is shed, how long it takes for the new shell to harden and if the animal can vary that length of time it takes to harden. So. It depends on the species and the size of the animal. So very small crustaceans, like um, for instance a small shrimp, can molt every few days and so it will harden, it can harden, the new shell can harden within hours. In larger animals like the blue crab, it may take several days to harden significantly. It may take even a month for it to harden completely. And, uh, so, so it's pretty variable on the size and also on the species. There's not much that the animal does to control it, but there certainly are factors that can influence it. So certain environmental factors. It could be temperature, it could be the amount of calcium that's available or you know, the acidity of the water. So there's a lot of chemistry, water chemistry and um, you know, other effects that probably have a greater control over how long it takes. Yes? What's the source of the calcium? Excuse me? What's the source of the calcium? So the question was what is the source of the calcium? So there's plenty available, usually in, in the marine environment it's a little bit easier for animals to just take up the calcium. They'll also reabsorb some of the calcium from their old skeleton and use that. That's a bigger issue for terrestrial crabs where they don't have so much calcium. And so they tend to store them in special structures. So they'll resorb the calcium from the old skeleton and store it in special structures like in their gut and then reuse it as they're producing the new skeleton. Sure. Yes. I'm sorry? Okay, so what kinds of crustaceans are more, most populous in the La Jolla Ecological Reserve? So that's a great question since I'm new here. <laughs> but um, certainly you have a lot of the small, I mean, copepods, things like that are clearly mo uh, most common. In terms of the larger animals, um, there's a lot of shore crabs, so like pachygraps species are pretty common. 
Uh, sand crabs are pretty common. Um, various shrimp species. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't list them all. Not yet, anyways. Yes? Lobsters won't. So do lobsters molt, and in particular, Atlantic lobsters? Yes, so all crustaceans molt. At some point, some animals, when they get so big, it's thought maybe they stop molting, or they just molt so slowly you don't even, or so infrequently that you don't really see them molting, but yes. Yes? Uh, what is the process for hermit crabs who, I don't know how, their exoskeleton is, but they certainly go around changing homes. <laughs> yes, so the question was what is the process for hermit crabs that you know clearly use um, a mollusk shell to live in? And they still go through the molting process, but theirs is a little different because half of them is covered with a rigid skeleton and the other half is more of a softer cuticle. And they do shed both of those, but they differentiate in how much they calcify, you know, they mineralize one part but not the other. And then as they get bigger, they just need to find bigger shells. Yes? Is ocean acidification affecting the calcification of the uh, crustaceans? So the question is, is ocean acidification affecting the calcification of crustaceans? And that's a great question, one that I have been working on since my time here, partly because there hasn't been much done on crustaceans. And for most calcifying organisms, there, it's been shown that ocean acidification makes it more difficult for them to produce calcified structures. And in, in fact, they can even dissolve. From the limited research on crustaceans so far, it appears that it actually enhances calcification. And so they tend to calcify more. And this is supported by some of the preliminary research that I've done as well. So they have a different response, but there is a response to it. Any other questions? Yes? So metapods can be very big examples to work with you've gotten hurt. So the question is, stomatopods can be very dangerous animals, and have I gotten hurt? <laughs> no, I've learned how to handle <laughs> crustaceans at this point, but I do know people that have gotten smashed and speared by them, and it's not a pretty sight. Yes. Any other? Yes. Um, what about the giant crab that we saw in the garbage can in front of the tree? Where does that thing live? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, where does that giant um, trash can climbing tree or trash can climbing crab live? Uh, they're not local, <laughs> but uh, maybe someday I'll have them in the lab. They uh, tend to be in more tropical locations, so off of um, uh, islands off around Australia. There's some um, islands off of, you know, in Polynesia. And so they're sporadic, a, a lot of islands. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So you deflated the land crab. So the question is, for the land crabs, it was easy to just withdraw air out of the a pocket, the gut, to deflate it. But how would you deflate one of the marine crabs? And it's not as tricky. So they do have, they have open circulatory systems. So they have a hemolymph, this, their version of blood, that is not confined to blood vessels. But it spreads out throughout the body. And so when they inflate with water, it just um, merges in with the hemolymph. And so there's not one uniform place where you can withdraw it, but certainly if you were to puncture it somewhere and allow it to drain, then it will deflate fairly, fairly quickly and, and um, unfortunately, usually fatally. How is the calcium incorporated into the shell? 
So the question is, how is the calcium incorporated into the shell? And there's been a lot of research on that to show how it can actually vary in the forms of the calcium that get deposited, and they tend to form through very specific um, pore canals that are spaced all through the skeleton, and they get it gets deposited in a pretty particular arrangement. Um, I'd have to go into details about more specific details about how the cuticle is structured to be able to explain that, which might be a little more than we can do right now. Yes. How does the sessile crustacean like a, like a barnacle get molded? So they grow a little differently. They um, <laughs> repeat that question. Oh, sorry. So the question was, how does a sessile creature like a barnacle um, uh, deal with molting? How does it undergo? And they actually molt by, they, they produce, um, they add additional shell plate material around. So it's not like they're just completely shedding the skeleton like one of the other, the crustaceans that I was talking about. Maybe one last question, anybody not get a chance yet? I'm just sharing the back. Yes. So the question is, is molting seasonal or dependent on individuals? There do tend to be seasons for a lot of species, but it's mostly associated because of warm water temperatures. And so warmer water tends to be better for molting than colder. So warm water and lots of nutrients and happy crabs, they'll molt more. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much. That was excellent. Okay, thank you.